OK, good morning, everybody. So I would like to introduce you all to Derek Lumsden. Derek and I have known each other, I don't know, seven years, something like that. <laughs> Derek is the owner of Polished Productions, Inc. He is currently based in Iowa and has been based in Iowa for a while. Um, he holds two master's degrees. Um, and he has been a part of Main Street and non Main Street communities for the last 10 years. He currently has his um, MSARP, which is the certification you get from Main Street America. And today he is going to be presenting on embracing change in your Main Street. So with that, Derek, take it away. Perfect. Thank you, Abby. Hello, everyone. As Abby said, my name is Derek Lumsden, and I don't know how many of you are affiliated with Main Street communities and such through the state of Indiana, but I've been involved with Main Street communities or Main Street aspiring communities for the last plus decade plus. And it's one of the things that if I had known such a thing existed when I was in high school, I would have tried to go be a college graduate of Main Street. So I finally found it. It's never too late, they say. Um, and so that's sort of what we're gonna talk about today embracing change. A lot of people embrace change on a personal level. It's a lot harder for a community or organization to embrace change just because of the way things are sort of set up in the world. So I'm going to attempt to share. Abby didn't mess it up. Um, there it is. Whoops. Ah. Perfect. Okay, so embracing change in your organization's main street. So one of the ways when I talk about change that I like to start is the broken clock adage. And for those that have never heard the broken clock adage, it's simply this, that even a broken clock is right twice a day. And so a lot of communities and organizations fall into this trap. They find something that they're really good at, or maybe two things, and they stay in that lane. And so like a broken clock twice a day, they have something they know they can count on, that they can do well and that they're gonna coast for the rest of their natural born days. So I like to sort of talk about before we get broken, how do we fix that type of mentality? And I use the example of a clock in my house. So right now there's a clock in my house. It's really cool. It shows all the different time zones around the world. So I can look at what time it is in my house and see what time it is in Singapore and be accurate. So it's a really cool clock and it shows the globe and it's fantastic. I noticed when we changed clocks back a couple of weeks ago that it was losing time. And one of the things that I think is tough for communities is they don't recognize when they're starting to go from really running on all cylinders to slowly Aaron, break. Lost, yeah. Sorry, we lost the presentation. Okay. I don't know how it's still up on my screen. Huh. I wonder why it shows on my screen and not yours. Do, do, do. Good. do you want to try and share it again? Maybe. Yeah, I am. Can you guys see it now? We can, do you have it in pre, pre, uh, presenting mode? It's on uh, slideshow. It says I'm sharing. Yeah, so we can see it, but it's not in like presenting mode. So you can see it with the things down the side? Yep. Huh. How in the world? Is it still on that or can you see the one screen now? Uh, still on the. OK, we'll do it that way. That's fine. OK, so. But anyway, there's a clock in my house that's broken or breaking. And so it's funny because two weeks later, so we changed clocks back a couple of weeks ago. Two weeks later, we still have not fixed this clock. It is still losing time. It is still showing about 20 minutes or late. And so that's the way a lot of communities function, in my opinion. They start out really well. Like I said, they're firing all cylinders and slowly over time, they get into their lanes. They have the one or two things they're fantastic at and they slowly drop off everything else. They don't realize that they're breaking and they get to a broken point, they don't know how to fix it. 
And so one of the things that is important as a community to do is always be aware of sort of where your strengths and weaknesses are. I don't really like to do SWOT analysis because I think they can be somewhat um, misrepresented. But I think having people come in and out, that's why I'm a big fan of things like term limits on boards, bringing people into things like um, committee work, getting different people involved from the public sphere, schools, city, county, all that sort of thing. I'm a big fan of that because they'll come in and they'll ask the question, why? Just like a three-year-old, why? That's the question you always need to be asking yourself. Why aren't we doing this? Why don't we keep continuing to do this? And that'll help you recognize when you're starting to break. Because if you get to a broken clock, when you're right only twice a day, it's almost impossible to change. And for anybody that's worked in or with government, you know, getting them to change once they're in their solid lane is almost impossible. So keeping that idea in mind, we're gonna go through this. Think about the breaking of broken clock as we go through it, we'll bring it back up again. But I want you to be thinking about how that might apply to your community and your organization. And Abby's familiar with me saying this, but this is my favorite quote. And this is from Grace Hopper. She was a United States Navy Rear Admiral and served for like 40 years in the armed services. She was also a computer scientist. She created one of the first computers. And her main thing was the most dangerous phrase in the language is, we've always done it this way. And that's the other way you can start to tell when a community or an organization is breaking. Well, why don't we try this? And the answer is, we've always done it this way. That's one of those telltale signs that you're starting to get that mentality of breaking or being broken. And so if you can start to recognize those signals, there are ways you can step into being a community that looks forward and embracing change. And embracing change is hard. Nobody's going to deny that. But if we can take over some of that, then it's important to realize. So on time being of the essence, trying to keep in that nice motif that I've been working with the clocks, some of the things that hit Main Street communities over the last three years have just been horrendous. From COVID-19, natural disasters in a lot of cases, you know, flooding. We had a derecho here in Iowa, a land hurricane, massive amounts of snow, fires in some places, the freeze in Texas. All those natural disasters on top of COVID-19 and not knowing what to do, and as well as trying to prepare for future crisis. So now we have supply chain issues. We have workforce issues. All these different things that are impacting the Main Street world like they've never impacted it before. How do we deal with these? And if we can't adapt to change, our clocks are going to break even faster than they would have in the past. Because in the past, you probably had a number of years before you started to slowly drift from running on all cylinders to being a broken clock. Now you could literally go from good to broken in a matter of a couple of months, depending on how well situated you are in your communities and with your partners. So it's important to keep in mind that time is of the essence. And that's one of the things that as a Main Street director, I can remember never having enough of. But this is why it's important to bring in partners and why it's important to have everyone understand that there's maintenance work involved. And that is not only for your organization, but your communities. No place is perfect. And places that may feel perfect, or you probably have a town in Iowa, or Iowa, sorry, in, in Indiana that everybody's like, oh, we could be the next whatever. In Iowa, it's either we could be the next Galena, Illinois, or we could be the next this. And that's one of the things is that those towns, the reason they're there, they've done the maintenance work. They've continued to adapt. They've continued to experience the change. They continue to know that there are things that they might be blindsided to. They might have tunnel vision. So they bring in those partners to make sure that they're all firing on the same cylinders. And so as a Main Street organization, the two questions that it's always important for me to ask people when I was a Main Street director, especially those that were our partners in town, even our board of directors. One, why do people stop in a community? Number one reason is to use the restroom. And people are four times more likely to spend money once they're out of the car. So, but if you look around your downtown or go talk to your businesses, how many of them say restrooms only for customers or they don't have a restroom at all? Some places don't even have restrooms that their employees have to go somewhere else to use the restroom and that they're not open convenient hours. So those that's the number one reason people stop in a community. If you can't stop and when it's convenient for you to do what you need, you're not gonna do some of the other elements. So you need to ask people, why do they stop? See what people think as to why they stop in your community. Most people do not guess this. Most people guess it's something else. Oh, it looks great. Oh, that's a store I wanna to go to. Very rarely do people stop in a town for anything other 
than having to use the restroom unless they were specifically going there. So when, so ask that question to people, ask it of your businesses, ask it of your public partners, ask it of your board, see what people come up with. I mean, this was research that was done by Roger Brooks a number of years ago, and he did, I think, 450 towns all over the U.S. and Canada. It might have been, maybe it was 4,000. I can't remember off the top of my head. But he did that, and this is the number one reason by far that people stop in a community. If you've ever been on a long road trip with kids, you know it's 100% the reason you stop somewhere that you might not have otherwise stopped. The other one is that when people stop, it's curb appeal. If you look at this building on the left where my cursor is, who's going to stop there and go pee versus the one on the right? And if you're in this building or in this situation here, how many of you might be like, you know, we're here, let's go ahead and eat, let's grab snacks, like let's get gas, if you have this type of environment. So make sure that you're asking your boards and your partners, why is it that people stop? What do we need to showcase? And that's something Main Street organizations are generally good at. But once you get into those lanes, those silos, you start to lose the other ones. You get that tunnel vision, you focus on one thing, one idea, and it starts to break down the benefit that a Main Street organization can bring to a community. So I'm gonna sort of break it down into three categories, the, the public angle, so the cities and the counties approach, the businesses approach, and then the Main Street organization approach. Because I feel that there's always different ways and different strengths that people can play to. Now I'm gonna use um, a town in Iowa that I worked with, and that's mainly because I don't know if Indiana has a program similar. So in the town of Osceola, where I was a Main Street director for six years, we did a program through the Community Development Block Program under HUD, and it's called the Downtown Revitalization. Not every state has this, but Iowa is one that has. Under their CDBG allocation, you can get money to do downtown facade restoration and revitalization on your downtown properties. And so what it is in Iowa is the state can put in a max of $500,000. The city puts in around $250,000 minimum and the property owners put in the rest. So you base it on a million dollar project. It's a 25, for every 25 cents the owner puts in, the city and the state put in 75 cents. The, the math doesn't always quite work like that, but that's sort of the overall project idea. And so it takes buildings like these. So we're thinking on the curb appeal, especially. This is a lawyer's building. It's a former opera house and back from the 1800s. You wouldn't think to look at it that was either because it doesn't have an eye appealing catch. But going through this program, reinvesting some of the money and putting it into the downtown for that curb appeal to help bring more people to stop. If they have to pee, let's make them stop in Osceola. Maybe they're not going to stop at a lawyer's office to go to the bathroom, but the overall curb appeal of the district is something the cities and the counties should have a vested interest in. That's sales tax money. That's road use money. That's all those different types of money that they don't get otherwise. Ta property tax alone does not do much for a city if they don't have alternate sources of revenue. This is where a Main Street community or an organization can really step in and say, hey, here's another way to add to those different funding pots that you get. Help us put this in there. Let's see what we can be done. So this building here went from this. The side didn't really change much, but the front did. It went from this look to this look. We, fat, we uncovered all that crap. So this red parching we took off, we took off this. We found the columns underneath. We found where the old windows used to be. They used to have some in the basement too. We added the stair. We put the windows back in up top, tuck pointed, painted. You can see that makes a huge difference. Between the two buildings, let's say this was someplace you were going to stop. Where would you go? Here or here? Hopefully, it's the second one because that's really the where I'm headed with this. But based on the curb appeal alone, this one has a much higher curb appeal than the previous one. Give another example here. This was a former like wedding dress type of shop. My wife actually got her prom dress here back when she was in high school. And this is not what I would call the most glamorous place to go get my wedding or prom dress and then now it's a realty company but they moved in and we took all this stuff off we moved all we put windows back in we took it back to its original look at its essence this program is a historic preservation program so you try to bring it back to some of its original look so and this is right on the main drag this is on the major highway through one of the major highways through town and it goes right through the downtown and this was one of the the signature places people stopped 
People would come from over an hour away to go to this lady's dress shop. She had a hell of a brand and a hell of a business, but this is what she was showcasing. So when she retired and sold to the realty company, it went from that to this. Again, brightens it up, opens it, lets you see and lets you see that there's businesses open and operating. And that's one of the things you want to do. People need to see activity. They need to believe that your downtown is going somewhere, not plateauing, not going the opposite way. Because back in the old days, this is what it would have looked like downtown. And at some point we went to this. So we started going backwards. When you start closing things in, tightening it up, boarding it up, that starts to give that feeling of closure, that feeling of moving backwards, your clock starting to break. So you've got to make sure that you're always winding that clock, doing the maintenance work. And this is something that is a great partnership. It's a benefit to the city and the counties. So they're more likely to help fund something like that, knowing they're going to get it back in some form of tax revenue. Not only property tax on the building, but again, road use tax, the law, the local option sales taxes, all those things add up when people stop in your community. So that's one of the easy ways, like I said, that's an easy example. There are other ways cities and counties can be involved, but giving them a way that they can pay in, that they can automatically see a return on that investment is something that you need to be able to showcase. And that's an easy way to do it by showcasing, here's what we can do. Here are the different pots of money that you can get a return on your investment for. The next one is businesses. And businesses are tricky because every business is different. They have a different mindset. There's different ages. Some have been there 80 years. Some have been there two weeks. How do you get them to sort of row together? Because you can't have them working at odds against each other. My favorite thing is when a, a new restaurant comes into town and the old restaurant that's been there for 100 years and they serve the same three things, they're like, well, this is going to put us out of business. Well, no, not necessarily. The goal is to how do you make yourself unique enough to be different than that restaurant so people keep coming? I know I live in a town with one restaurant, and if we don't feel like that food, we don't go. But when there's two restaurants, we have a pick, so there's likely we can stay local if we want, depending on what we want that day. So the more variety you have, the better it can be. And that's something that's hard for business to wrap their head around because they want all the money. They want to be the only one, so they want to lose anybody to any competition. But COVID taught us that there's a number of different ways that you can be proactive and creative. So on the business side, one of them, you've got to get your businesses into the 21st century. They've got to have a variety of outlets. They've got to be open. They've got to be online. Whether it's a website, eBay, some sort of pay option, their own website, they've got to be online. They've got to have open hours. And it can't be I'm open the second Saturday of every month from 1 to 1.30 p.m. They've got to be open in such a way that people can go to them and get what they want. Some people still like to shop in person. Some don't. They've got to have both. So getting the variety of outlets and hours and the online modes of operation. Get your businesses into that. If they're still thinking, you know, a lot of places still don't take credit card. They don't take checks. They'll take cash. Well, that's great. Not everybody carries cash in, especially in today's society. So they're already starting to break that clock. They're moving backwards. We've got to stop it where they stop losing time. We've got to catch them up and do that maintenance work. The next one is letting people do experimentation. In the town I'm currently sitting in, we have a coffee shop that had to close. They had no way of having people come in and congregate during the height of COVID. So they tried an experiment. They decided that they would do be open for dinner, but obviously restaurants couldn't be open either. What they did is about a day or two before, they put out, here's what we're going to have for dinner on Wednesday. RSVP by such and such a time on Tuesday, they would have it ready by such a time on Wednesday that people could drop by and pick it up, or they would deliver. That coffee shop was busier during COVID and brought in more money than any other time since she's been open because she tried something new and people just wanted another option. And she's looking at keeping it in place now, maybe not every day of the week. I think she was doing Tuesday through Friday on the dinners, doing maybe one or two days a week where she does dinner and getting people another option. Giving people options is something that a community and organizations need to thrive on because they've got to be able to do things that help push that narrative forward. Hey, we like going to this town in Indiana because of all the great businesses. They're open these hours. They have these options. That's what keeps your clock from breaking, doing that maintenance work, experimenting with different ways that you can be proactive. And then transparency. And this one probably will go away, but it's a good rule of thumb. And during the height of COVID, a lot of places were buying PPE. They're putting up shields. They were adding a lot of expense that they had no way to get compensated for. 
and this came actually from a town in Toronto or town in Toronto, Canada, town in Toronto, a business in Toronto, Canada. They put on their thing, they had their service. Here was the taxes. And then they had a COVID surcharge and it was for additional PP. It was like a dollar. So because it was a hair salon, they had to have the masks and the gloves and everything to do the hair. They charged that. They were very honest about it. And they put it on there and pe some people didn't accept it, but the ones that did say, you know, thanks for not just raising prices or adding it on there without telling us. Being transparent as a business is one of those things that can really help. Being transparent anywhere, especially nowadays, you heard a lot in the government sector. It's just as important as the private sector. Be transparent in your business as a Main Street organization. Be transparent. Let people know what you're thinking, what you're doing, why you're doing something. And you don't have to give them all every single reason but have some of that forward facing ability to tell them, here's why we want to do X. And then this is, I don't know if you, that picture's not very good. I don't know if you can see it that well, but businesses just need to be creative too. This is in a town, this is in Osceola as well. This is a sort of a five and dime. It was called Robinson's. It's a store that was around for 80 years. They were sort of the local five and dime, Ben Franklin all rolled into one. Well, one day, they decided they needed to do something. We just happened to have a consultant in town through our state program that was helping us with window displays. Now, looking at this window display, and I know you guys are muted, but most people look at this window display and I will ask, what do you think they're selling? And I will get two or three wrong answers before somebody finally looks here. This window display is about paint. If those paint cans were not in the window, you would have no idea that this was about paint. And literally before the consultant started, the only thing in the window was paint. And the business owner was like, why am I not selling anything? Well, that's not very attractive. I mean, okay, you've got paint, it's on sale. Okay, I don't need that. So what they did instead is they brought the consultant in. We went upstairs and found these mannequins from the 1950s. We brought it down. He said he wanted a paint scheme. So our consultant, if you look at these dresses, they are the little paint swatches you can get to compare colors. Our volunteers in their business made these paint chip dresses, put them in the window, put this color scheme on the back, and then just put paint on the next to them to showcase the paint was for sale. Nothing in the window says sale on paint. Nothing says it. For the next two weeks while this was up, people would come in, ask about the window, take pictures of the window, he said he didn't sell a lot of paint, unfortunately for him. He sold a lot of other things. So this was the marketing piece that drew people in. And then they bought other things that they needed. Some people did buy paint because they needed it. But by not making this just about paint, by making it something that was attractive, he, he did some of, some of his own maintenance work. He thought about what can I do differently? And you can't see it, but there's a window over here as well that we did something similar with on the farm and tool side. But that's a way for businesses to be creative. So making sure that they're not also getting into their lane. Hey, I'm really good at making a cheeseburger. I'm not going to make anything else. Get them to step outside their comfort zone. Get them to make sure that they're not breaking, that they're not becoming a broken clock, that they're only good at one thing. And if they stop being good at that or people don't want it, they lose their vitality. The next one is Main Street organizations in and of themselves. So when I started, I was told two things as a Main Street director. One, that your job is to help remove the burden on local government. That if, especially if they're going to help fund you, you've got to figure out ways to help remove some of the burden on them. That's why you're in charge of the downtown. You deal with the businesses. You find out if there are issues. And if it's a city necessary thing, you can go and help. That's why you write grants for your downtowns. That's why you try to bring in new business. You take that lift off the city. They still got to be involved, but if you can remove even part of that burden, you've paid for yourself many times over and they're more likely to stay a partner. So one is the removal, the burden removal. The second one is you've got to be out there. You've got to be doing what they used to call street time. I don't even think they still use that phrase anymore, but that's getting out on the street, knocking on the doors, being in those shops, talking to people. And they used to say you should do at least 10 hours a week when I started, you know, a couple hours a day out visiting businesses in your district, talking to them, talking to people out on the streets, doing that work, even you know, walking the sidewalk, see a piece of trash, pick it up. Street time. So people saw you out there as the representative of your organization. And these businesses got so used to you that if you didn't show up one day or one week, they would call. 
So making sure as a Main Street director, you've got that in your mind, removal of the burden off local government and street time, you can be that resource. So moving to the next one, resource aid. I don't know how the state of Indiana works, but a lot of state coordinating programs have different grant programs. They have different way, technical services, bringing all those resources into your businesses and your communities. That's your job. And the more you're in those businesses, you're going to be that resource for them, whether it's for something very minutely local or if they need technical assistance from the state, they're going to look to you as that resource as you bring in others. So make sure that you're bringing in resources often enough that you're seen as valuable. Because if you bring them in once every 10 years, again, that's sort of that breaking clock mentality. Your clock's starting to slow down and eventually it'll be broken. People aren't going to see you as a resource. Oh, hey, Betty show, throws a great 4th of July thing, but she does nothing for my business. I have, If I have a question about succession planning, she's not the person I go to. And I don't know if there's a Betty on. Don't take that personally, Betty, if there is. But that's one of the things you've got to be able to do. And by doing what a Main Street director naturally should do, by being out in the public, you can be that resource aid. And finally, the last thing. The one thing I'm always told, and fundraisers are told this, Main Street directors are told this, volunteer recruiters are told this. If you don't ask someone to do something, the answer is always no. So innovate and invite. Find new ways to bring people in. Find creative ways. Ask people that are involved. Hey, what would make this more fun? What else could we do? And then start trying that and invite people to come. There are tons of organizations in your town. There are a ton of people that might be involved. One of the things that I've done across my years in economic development is if we have a committee, we don't just put people on it to put people on it. it when I was in design and when doing design, one lady loved to garden. Hey, how would you like to run our downtown planter program and tell us what we should do and how we should plant it? She loved it. She didn't have to come to meetings. She didn't have to worry about signage or historic preservation. She had one element of the design phase that she focused on and it blew up and she got FFA kids involved. And she brought all kinds of energy to that because we tried something different. We just didn't have a meeting to talk about everything design related. We let her run with hers and she gave you know, like an update quarterly to the design committee. Here's what we did on downtown aesthetics. So as a Main Street organization, you've got to be adaptable and you've probably got to show the way. Businesses and government are least adaptable. As a Main Street organization, you've got to be nimble. You've got to be able to wind that clock, do the maintenance, bring people up to speed on the times there are now. Um, the next one I'm going to touch, I'm just going to touch on this real quick. Destination Diaries is something that would probably fall within the realm of a Main Street organization. But this is something that a friend of mine and I do. And you'll be hearing from Sarah Thompson next month. But this is something as former Main Street directors, Sarah and I were sitting around talking about what could we do? How could we showcase some really cool things in the state of Iowa that people overlook? And even Main Streets can sometimes overlook. You have a business in your district. Oh, it's really cool. We showcase it. We put up their ads on Facebook. They're on our website. You know, maybe we write about them on a on a up spotlight in our newsletter. But how do you do something different? And so she and I were trying to discuss this through. And we kind of came up with this idea of Destination Diaries. All it is is a simple YouTube channel where we go around to businesses in the state of Iowa that might fit in one certain sector. It might be in a cool small town nobody's heard of. It might be a business in a larger district that just kind of gets overlooked. It's fine somehow to bring out what we do. And then we go there and we film. So we do an interview. We do some goofy stuff. If there's something they can showcase, that's even better. Like we went to a magic shop once. And Sarah learned how to do magic and she tried to show me. He showed us some magic. It was really great. We found a way to showcase that's outside that norm. But with all the ways to do this lately, with being able to film on your phones, TikTok, there are ways to showcase that maybe you just don't have. I'm gonna see if I can pull this up real quick. Okay, so here's the site. But what we do is we just go somewhere. Um, let me do, uh, let's try this one. Let me know if you can't hear it. We're hearing the ad so we can hear it. Okay. I'm going to jump ahead. Based off of uh, my wife and her experiences with her 
grandmother and growing up in the attic and finding all sorts of neat stuff back in the day. I've got a lot of. And so we do a number of different yeah, things. So you drive by and you might not know. Yeah, there's all this stuff down there. You're doing a great job. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Yes. And I must. So that's just something simple to do. Like I said, we take a weekend. Usually we'll go out on a Saturday. We'll film a couple of places. We edit ourselves. Clearly it's not Hollywood level, but this is something as a Main Street director you could do. You could go in, Facebook Live something. You could do a quick, you know, 30 second minute TikTok or whatever it is on how those could work. Interviewing people, put them out there, helping showcase, doing something different with what we have today, allowing you, like I said, to fix that clock, you've got to do maintenance work. And sometimes maintenance work isn't easy, but you've got to break out of those lanes. You've got to get those blinders off and get out of that tunnel. And then breaking clocks. Like I said, we have one in my house that we still haven't fixed. And there was another one in the house that when we changed the clocks back in October, I noticed was slow. And it wasn't until probably February that my wife finally took it down. I figured out all we needed was new batteries. Sometimes the answer is so simple that what you could do, your clock is starting to break. If you recognize it, sometimes the fix is so easy that all you have to do is put in a little bit of effort and you can change the entire course of it. That clock in the bathroom that we let go almost six months is now keeping perfect time. All we did was change the battery. It was a simple solution, but we recognized the problem, we fixed it, and now it's not breaking. We still haven't done the one in the living room yet. It's only been a couple of weeks, but that one's much more complicated because it has the around the world situation. So if we let it go too long, it may be a situation where we can't get it fixed by a simple battery. We may have to take it somewhere to get it fixed, which can be longer and harder to do. But also things you've got to realize about breaking clocks is one, you're going to be against those people. Remember Grace Hopper, you know, where we've always done it this way or back in the day mentality. And if you can't see the picture, I'm a big back to the future fan. That's a picture of 1955 Hill Valley when Marty shows up. So we want as Main Street directors, we're almost always somewhat living in the past that we want to take it back to its 1940s and 50s glory. Because at the height of downtown, that's when downtown was, the 1940s and the 1950s. They started back usually in the 1800s, early 1900s, but they were really at their peak in the 1940s and 50s. So we want to go back to that. You want to go back to that look, but you don't want to go back to that mentality. So you've got to be good at threading the needle. We want this cool historic look, but we've got to live in the 21st century and be looking ahead to the 22nd and the 23rd. We can't live like it's 1945 anymore. Remember the de development's incremental. Main Street preaches that, you know, change happens a little bit at a time. Pandemic years 2020, 2021 showed us that change happens a lot faster than development. So we've got to try to keep ahead of it. We've got to be aware. And if we're keeping our house maintained, keeping our clocks running smoothly, then things like pandemics and natural disasters, they're still going to affect us but we're going to be better situated. If we've slowly built over time, this solid foundation, keeping it maintained, keeping it running, keeping our house and our clocks in order, then some of those vast changes aren't going to hit us as intensely because change is automatic, development's incremental. And then finally, remember that communities are symbiotic. When all the partners work together, everybody wins. When you have a city council that works well with your downtown businesses, your Main Street organization, your school, everybody works well together, you can notice that those communities can usually rally around projects, rally around businesses, rally around people, and really get things done. Going back to some of those communities that you aspire to be, most of the time if you go to them and ask, you know, who leads this, it's a group effort. It's a community effort. They realize if one element suffers, oh, we have a crappy business district, then your city suffers, your school suffers, all those suffer. But if everybody can lift everybody else up, everybody is in a healthier situation. So when I talk about downtowns and breaking clocks and trying to maintain what you need to do, I like to show this clip from Independence Day. And this is where Jeff Goldblum comes in. He's telling the president that there's an issue. You've got to pay attention to this. And this is something that as Main Street directors, especially, you're the tip of the spear. You've got to be able to walk into a city council meeting or to a business or to a local organization and tell them that things are starting to break. Our clock isn't working right. And always remember that you've got to be ready because at some point, time's going to run out. The clock is ticking. And the clock is ticking. 
you and that's a powerful scene in that because he turns his computer around you see that it's counting down the clock is ticking there's going to be some point that it's not a point of no return but that you're going to go so far down that hill you're going to be so broken that it's going to take ages to climb back out of it knowing development's incremental you've got to get started sooner you've got to get started faster working on how we build this in and you do it with partners you do it with learning some of those things and remember that a broken clock while it's right twice a day still gives all those other times a day and all those other possibilities that aren't happening. All right. Thanks, everybody. I don't know if you had questions for me or not. Uh, don't save. I don't need to. Yeah. If um, anybody has any questions for Derek, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask or put them into the chat. Oh, and while people are thinking about it, for those of you that did reach out to me, I know a couple of people reached out to me via my website. I did respond, but if I've never emailed you before, it might have ended up in your spam. So a couple of you used my contact form on the website. I did reach back out to you. Um, if you didn't see it, it might have ended up in your spam. All right. So, um, Abby, will his presentation be available anywhere? Yeah, it is being recorded and we will put it on the Okra YouTube channel. So if you are or the direct links, at least in his presentation. So some of the videos, I wasn't able to see it. It didn't come through on my screen. Um, so I've put in the chat the, um, the YouTube to Destination Diaries and I have uh, linked his website and when we post it to YouTube we'll put those links also in the comments. Perfect thank you. Welcome. All right um, so we have a question about a HUD grant um, breakdown of that. Yeah so Catherine on that one like I said I don't know if the state of Indiana has it. Iowa was one of the first to do it but under HUD they get a CDBG allocation and so that's usually for towns that aren't entitlement communities so under 50,000 people and in this particular pot of that allocation is the downtown revitalization. So the state gets so much of an allocation that they put in that. And then individual communities can apply. So when we apply for a community, we try to target a downtown facade restoration project on $1 million. That takes into account the architect fees, the administration fee through the Council of Governments or Regional Planning Commission, and then the construction work itself. And then we break that down into the work. So the state puts in half a million dollars maximum. They can put in less. And if you're a smaller community, I think the max is 300,000. If you're a community under a thousand or something like that. And then the city is required to put in at least 25%. So they have to put in a minimum of $250,000 on a million dollar project. And then the project owners, so the different property owners in the district have to put in 25% of their cost. So if their building costs $100,000, they have to be willing to put in $25,000 towards the overall project. And then it does like anything, it goes out to bid for a contractor. One general contractor does it all and they get subs. So local people can bid to be subs or a general contractor. They've got to have historic preservation experience. They've got to be willing to follow those rules and pay Davis-Bacon wage rates. So sometimes that lock knocks local contractors out. But then you have two years to complete the downtown renovations and to get that so it it's a little different but those are sort of the overall broad brush strokes um, if you have more specific questions you can let me know I, like i said i don't know if you guys have that or not um some states do some states don't have it i think i was probably the most intense i know i know missouri has it but there's uh the owners have to put in quite a bit more so that is that one and then deborah what tips do you have for communities that don't want to see change um the sarcastic answer is get better people in leadership positions usually if you look around the people that don't want change are the people that have been there forever and i know that's tough to say because i know when i ran for county supervisor a number of years ago people didn't want to hire me because i wasn't retired well don't you want someone that's active and involved and usually the way that it works is you get some of the major players in the community on your side so you go to a bank that really wants to be active you find that one council person that's always voting for some of those progressive elements. 
you go and get the business, a new business that started and said, hey, I started my business here. I want to see some of these changes. You start developing that unique group of people and have them start speaking. Main Street's always going to be the tip of the spear. They're going to be the ones that are the implementation stage. But if you can get some other people to be sort of the public presentation face of it, you have a lot better options. And sometimes, I hate to say it, sometimes it's as simple as bringing someone like Abby in. Because a lot of local people see that, oh, you're local. You you don't know what you're talking about. Did you bring an expert in from 40 miles or more away? Oh, that makes perfect sense. You could have said it until you're blue in the face. Someone like Abby comes in and says the exact same thing. Oh, you know what? She might be right. Sometimes it's that simple. Um, you're going to, I have been in one community. Everybody was against change. And I said, where do you see yourself in 10 years? We did a little planning exercise. And based on their, they'd lost population every year. They'd lost business every year. Their tax rates were through the roof. They were continuing to lose people. Ask the simple question, is that sustainable? Do you see that long-term working? And as a Main Street organization, it's tough because you have your district, but sometimes you've got to pull in the entire community of issues to say, here's how Main Street can solve part of them. So that's one of the things that You've got to have a narrow focus, but also a 30,000 foot view of the entire community to bring, and that might bring in different partners, school, city, major businesses, things like Rotary, bring those people in, ask them what they think, go to them. If you're not doing public presentation at least once a year of like Rotary and Lions Club, even at the city council beyond asking for funding, you're going to have a lot harder time. I'm someone that's apparently glutton for punishment. I currently have nine communities I work with. I go to city council meetings in all of them, even the ones that don't fund us. And I did as a Main Street director. I, I was at, at city council meetings. Let's see. They had them twice a month. I was probably at 22 of 24 every year in my Main Street community. Even if I had nothing on the agenda, even if I wasn't asking for money, I was there. And what happened over time like the first year they all kind of looked at me funny but by the end of my six years in Osceola what they were doing is when something came up that might impact the downtown or might impact something that would play out of the downtown be sort of a tertiary or secondary result they would turn to me and go Derek how will this impact downtown and that's one of the things becoming that resource for them remember you're a resource age you're there to help take the burden off local government so if you can get one or two people to start to see that benefit, as well as bring people in that want change, you have a much better option of getting people to change. And I know that's sort of a lot to put on your plate, but I'm sure you have people on your board and on your committees or people that volunteer for events or that one business you know downtown that would love to see something changed. Harness that energy, bring them in, help them, have them help you get this done. Oh, okay. Indiana has an MSRP in preserving Main Street. Okay. So you guys do have something. I don't know the exact details of yours. So that'd be something to ask Abby. But just knowing that there are those types of resources out there can sometimes be a benefit. Learn what's out there. And you know what? My favorite thing is to ask. You don't know if something's eligible. You don't know if you're eligible for something until you ask. There's a lot of times that people say, oh, well, I read the, the notification of funding and it seems like I don't fit. Ask. There, you don't know how many times I've gotten grants or gotten some sort of funding or partnership because all I did was ask the question, hey, we're thinking of doing this. What do you think? And they're like, oh, I don't know if that qualifies. And let someone else do the legwork for you. Let you know the state HUD or state CDBG office do that work. Find out. Ask the question, hey, we want to do this project. Are we eligible through this funding? Um, okay. Then, oh, that's preserving Main Street. Okay. Are there other questions for me? So Derek did bring up in his presentation something that our um, nationally accredited Main Streets and our Indiana affiliated Main Streets um, should be taking advantage of, and that is our technical assistance through Indiana Main Street. Um, just a reminder that those forms are due back to me at noon. Uh, Derek, can you kind of talk about how important um, working with your state organization is as a Main Street? Sure. So obviously I've been in a number of Main Street towns and I'm actually helping a town now go through Main Street certification here in Iowa. 
So one of the things that you've got to realize is that, especially in the smaller towns, and I, I pretty much live in the 10,000 and under towns, is that you don't have access to everything. And one of my favorites is like architecture or engineering type firms. How many of you are in a town of like 3,000 people? We clearly don't have someone that does that. And that's what's beautiful about the state. Because as a Main Street director, my worst point, you know, you have the four points. My worst one was design. I can talk historic preservation all day. I can tell you the type of mortar. I can do all that. Having to try to draw something for someone and say, here's what your building could look like. That, that is not my strong suit. So knowing that there's technical assistance, you know, like in the state of Iowa, they had two design people. You send it in. Here are the changes they'd like to see. Can you shoot that back to us? Working with SPDCs and SBAs through your Main Street organization. Um, having them come in and even do facilitations. Um, strategic planning. Some of those organization element points that you might need. Having them come and present to your city councils or to some of your organizations if they can be there. That's another huge way to enact some of that change hey, the people of the state think this is huge, that we can do this. Doing that technical assistance is by far one of the easiest things you can do. And again, that shows your value. Hey, I don't do this, but we have a resource at the state that does. Let's bring them in and have them talk to you. That shows your value. That shows the state's program value. It's a win-win for everybody as long as you can bring that technical resource in. I will say too, and I'm sure Abby's going to love this, but one of the things that I also think as a Main Street organization that you need to do is also work with your state program to have them be your advocates. And so I know a lot of state programs are sort of hands offish in the local sphere, but sometimes you need that heavy bat. You need that big stick to come in and you need to be honest about it. You need to say, hey, we've tried X, Y, and Z. Abby, come in and swing this big stick. Not that she's going to come, you know, beat up anybody, but have that higher level, that heftier level, make sure that they're just as involved in your community as you are. And that's tough because there's a lot of different communities, but you've got to have that same buy-in from the state that you want buy-in from your local stakeholders. So it really is a continuum of how you work, but the more you use their resources, the more you bring them to town, the more you have them involved in your communities, the easier that's going to be for you. All right, any last call for questions? All right, I'm not seeing any. Um, all right, thank you so much, Derek. Uh, yep. We really appreciate you taking the time and um, talking to our communities about how to embrace change. Uh, like I said, we will be posting this uh, to YouTube, to the Okra YouTube channel, which will also include the links. Um, I posted also Derek's um, website, so if you want to reach out to him, I'm sure he would love to hear from you. Yeah, and just check your spam for when I email you back. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Have a great day, and thanks again, Derek. Thank you. Do you have to end it, Abby? I want to let me end.